Our culture emphasizes more than most cultures the concept of time. I can assure you, having been in uh, several countries of the world, and some of you I'm sure as well, uh, they don't emphasize time the same way. Um, in Africa, if you walk two hours to get to your service, your um, sort of hut, maybe, uh, open at the sides usually, a lot of their churches are. If you make your way there that long, you sometimes don't uh, arrive at the same time all the time uh, because of what you might encounter along the way through the tall grass and all of that. And then once they get there, they stay for hours, of course. Uh, but uh, the time concept in our culture is, well, we're a lot more specific. In fact, if you and I were going to meet a stranger, and I remember doing this, go to a restaurant, going to meet this guy. Well, what does he look like? Well, they kind of describe him a little bit. But basically, you and I sort of judge who this person might be based on when they arrive, right? If I tell you this afternoon at 2 o'clock, you go to this restaurant, you need to meet this person, then you're going to watch who shows up right at 2 o'clock. That's our culture. <laughs> That'll help determine who we're looking for. Well, today we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. And one of the most unique things, at least one of the impressive things to me, is how timely God puts together all of his program and how timely he presented his king. God's Messiah presented himself right on time according to God's prophetic timetable. That's the kind of awesome God we have. And so I hope in the minutes I have, we can kind of celebrate that. God promised the Messiah's coming throughout all of the Old Testament history. In fact, God promised the ultimate sacrifice for sin that the Messiah would be from the very beginning. Now, we know it was chosen before the foundations of the world. Jesus Christ was chosen as our sacrifice for sin. But already then, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, after their fall, after their sin, God already promised Genesis 3.15, if you want to turn there with me quickly, Genesis 3.15, as part of the curse that uh, God hands out, and specifically he's talking to the serpent in, in uh, verse 15, Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, I don't know what translation Bible you might be using. Mine has the second seed, capital. It, of course, talks about a person. We know that, too, because it says, He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, of course, there's a debate today in the liberal circles as to whether this really indeed does talk about a coming Savior. I think it does. He will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Um, Satan, of course, will be fatally, uh, or was fatally, uh, you know, conquered at the cross. And of course, we wait uh, for that to be finally carried out. But already then, they were told that they would need a Messiah. First sacrifice ever God did as he uh, killed animals, made clothing for Adam and Eve, and instructed them to sacrifice. Very interesting. Go to China, and in there, you know, higher, in those letters that are pictorial, you see Adam and Eve sacrificing in some of those letters. There's lots of biblical truth in those original um, pictures that they used. So Adam and Eve were uh, sacrificing, symbolizing someday this promised Messiah, this seed that would come someday. And all of the animals sacrificed then down through the Old Testament all symbolize a coming, once for all, ultimate payment. And the writer of Hebrews, of course, assures us that no animal blood ever paid the ultimate price for sin. It was only a temporary atonement. But when the Messiah came, Jesus Christ, he ultimately paid for it. And he's seated at the right hand of God today because it is finished. God revealed to Daniel the exact time of the coming of the Messiah. I invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> Daniel is in captivity to Babylon. 
skip ahead some years from where we were with John this morning in the uh, adult Bible class. Now the captivity has taken place. Daniel and a few other young men were taken captive. They become part of um, Kim Nebuch King Nebuchadnezzar's um, you know, government. And then, of course, the Babylonian Empire falls. The Persians take over. Daniel is fortunate enough not to be killed along with every, a lot of others government officials. He's a government official in the second government uh, empire as well. And Daniel is reading Jeremiah. And he realizes that the captivity, as Jeremiah specified the length, is just about over. And so Daniel begins to pray to God that God would be faithful and he would take a remnant back and reestablish Jerusalem. And he also is asking God, God, is now the time that you're going to institute the kingdom? And God sends Gabriel with a message and says, no. No, the discipline of the nation of Israel is not over. And there will be, even though the people will go back to Jerusalem, it's not yet time for the kingdom to be reestablished. And I want to pick up in Daniel 9, verse 24 uh, through 26. Gabriel comes and says, understand this vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. I'm going to stop right there. Daniel is given by Gabriel this time sequence. Now, first of all, God is talking in groups of seven. We're not used to that. We talk in groups of ten. We're metric everything, right? And we talk about decades, ten years, and we talk about centuries, ten tens, hundred years, and, and, and um, you know, thousand years. Israel ran on sevens. There were seven days every week. Seventh day was a day of rest. Every seventh year was a sabbatical year. After seven sevens, 49 years, there was a sabbatical year. And then the 50th year was a jubilee year. Everything was in sevens. Those of you who are into computers, you know the computers think in ones and zeros. <laughs> So that's why this is not strange at all for Daniel or for the nation of, of uh, the Jews to think in sevens. Seventy seven, seventy weeks. Uh, lots of our English translations translate it. It's literally seventy sevens are determined. Uh, so if you, of course, use the math, seventy sevens is 490 years. And then this passage divides it into three parts. The first seven weeks, or, or, or first week, seven years, 62 weeks of seven years, and a final week of seven years. Seventy sevens. The time period also needs a beginning. That's pretty important. If you want to know when the Messiah is coming, you've got to know when the beginning was. And so God specifies that. He says, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. The command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, you can find in biblical, Bible and history, four commands. First was Cyrus's command to go back and rebuild the temple. So the first remnant goes back and rebuilds a small temple. The decree of Darius confirming that previous decree. Then the decree of Artaxerxes to Ezra to go back in 457. And then the decree of Artaxerxes to Nehemiah, authorizing the rebuilding of the city, 444 BC. In, we won't take time this morning, but you can go back and read in the first two chapters of Nehemiah that story, how Nehemiah come, is praying for the city of Jerusalem, and he receives a report, of course, that things aren't going very well there, the wall's all broken down, the city's a mess, yeah, they have a little a temple built there, but... The people are in great desperate situation and no protection from any enemies. 
And he comes before the king, and of course he's sad. That's something you don't do in front of a king. That is not kosher. And so uh, the king asks him, what is wrong? And Nehemiah is, um, he's been praying, and he's bold enough to say, my city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins. And I'm grieving about that. <clears throat> and is it possible that I could be sent back to rebuild the city? And you know, God, through ne Nehemiah's prayers, uh, has Artaxerxes agree and give that command that uh, Nehemiah should take the articles he needs and the help he needs and lead some more people back and go back and rebuild that city. There is the command that Daniel is talking about. So, after this two front period, 69 sevens, 483 years from that date, Daniel learns the Messiah is going to come. Now, what is so impressive to us as we celebrate the triumphal entry is that Jesus formally presented himself as the Jewish king as he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey and they waved Hosanna, said Hosanna, waved their palm branches, laid their coats on the ground for him as he formally presented himself as their king. And that triumphal entry occurred exactly on the day God had prophesied. That's the kind of God we serve. If you properly calculate, not using our years and days and math and weeks, but if you use a 30-day month the way the Jewish calendar does, a 360-day year, and then they added a month every so many years to make up for the uh, time that we add the five extra days. We have 365 days of the year. They did it differently, of course. We even have a leap day. They took care of all of that. If you use their calendar, you will find that exactly from the day that that command was given for uh, March 5th, 440 BC, that decree to go back and rebuild um, the city of Jerusalem, to March 30th AD, excuse me, that should be 33, <laughs> uh, that, that, or March 30th is the day, I'm sorry, the year 33. Um, that day is the triumphal entry, and that is exactly to the day, the 483 years that God revealed to Daniel. And that's exactly what Jesus talks about as he comes on that day. You'll remember that Jesus, at his triumphal entry, stopped outside the city and looked over Jerusalem and wept over it and said that this was the day. Luke 19, 41, 44. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, Jesus knew this was a special day. The things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. Of course, that was fulfilled in 70 AD. The Titus Roman general came and destroyed the city. Verse 44, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This was the day that the Messiah would come. Now, if the scribes and Pharisees who claimed to know scripture and had memorized large parts of it and claimed to, you know, want to obey it every dot and every detail, if they had studied Daniel 9, they would have known Jesus was indeed their Messiah simply because he came on the appointed day. But they missed it. They weren't looking for that kind of Messiah, and they missed it. But God's prophecy was fulfilled perfectly. He entered the city, of course, on a donkey, not a stallion. He didn't come as the Roman generals came. He didn't come in great power, for he knew he needed to die for your sin and mine first. Before he would come a second time, which he will, on a stallion, and come as king of kings and lord of lords. 
And then, of course, on Friday, he died. He was crucified, rejected by the leaders of the nation and who incited the Romans to crucify him. And Daniel says that. He says in verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That's a word for killed, executed. But not for himself. There will be, really the Hebrew says, and for him there will be nothing. Meaning no kingdom. Daniel, no kingdom at this time. Uh, he's not going to, re even though he came and presented himself formally as the king, he's not going to be the king right now. So, we know, cut off, to destroy, to kill, there's nothing for him. And the crucifixion happens just as Jesus had prophesied and just as he had prepared his disciples. Now, of course, for us living today in the church age, we realize something Daniel didn't. In between that 62-year period and that last seven years, right up in here, is a mystery age. And Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no Old Testament prophet saw this mystery age. It was revealed in the New Testament. Jesus, in the middle of Matthew, uh, first 10 chapters of Matthew, he presents himself as the king of the Jews. And then he begins to change and tell his disciples, the rulers of the Jews are going to reject me. And I'm going to be crucified. And he begins to prepare them for a church which the Old Testament prophets knew nothing about. And today you and I know that mystery time before the last seven years is really the church age in which we are living. Contrary to Daniel's time clock, which was exact to the day, Jesus did not give us a time clock for the church age. You and I are to be waiting for his surprise that's what Jesus said in John 6. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and take you to be with me, the rapture. And of course, when the disciples asked him when that would be, he said only the Father will give that command, which is according to Jewish custom. He's talking about Jewish wedding custom here, really. And so we await a seven-year tribulation that will finish the discipline, God's discipline on the, on the nation of Israel before Jesus Christ returns the second time to earth on that white stallion and sets up his kingdom for a thousand year millennium. That's the prophecy of Daniel. And what is so interesting and what we focus on today is the triumphal entry being exactly on time. Now, this should instruct us about some things. God wants us to study this and understand it. And he wants us to learn some things from his exact timing. First of all, God has always fulfilled his prophecy in great detail. There are some people today who say, well, it's symbolic in the book of Revelation and who knows how much is, you know, metaphor and how much is symbolic and um, maybe none of it will happen. There's a, a part of the church that believes that. You know, God always pre pre prepared all of his prophecies and fulfilled them exactly. If he says Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem, he is. If he says that he's going to have a triumphal entry on this day in history, he does. That's the kind of awesome God we have. And he's going to fulfill future prophecy the same way. And so you and I, as we study prophecy, God has blessed us with this book. He has blessed us with telling us what's going to happen in the future so that we don't need to be worried and shocked and uh, wonder as we look at our world, what in the world is going on. We know who's going to win in the end. We know on whose side we are. We know how he's going to do it. I mean, all of this detail. And we serve a God who is sovereign and all-powerful and all-knowing, who can work it out to the greatest detail. That is impressive. Uh, that's awesome. God, unless we understand his word, we're going to miss key truths. Now, these Jewish people, they did not study Daniel. They did not understand that this was their day. That would have proven that Jesus was him. They just passed it all by. You know, one of my key questions as I talk to someone who's really into prophecy and has studied it, and uh, that they're a scholar in that, this last seven years is going to be the same way. Revelation proves that Daniel was talking about days and years and months because Revelation does the same thing. 
Revelation says seven exact years, divides it in three, two, three and a half periods. Revelation says, I think it's 42 months, seven years. Revelation talks about the very days. And so once the decree is signed, which Daniel goes on to uh, talk about in verse 26 and 27, once the decree is signed by the world leader who becomes the Antichrist, a peace pact with Israel, the time clock begins. And exactly seven years to the day, Jesus Christ will return. And my question to prophecy experts is, why don't the Jews understand that? I mean, Satan understands that. He knows scripture. He knows how short his time is. He knows when Jesus Christ is going to come back. That's why he's going to rally all the, all the armies of the world to uh, the Valley of Armageddon to resist him. Why don't the Jews know that? Same mysterious answer. Just like they missed his first triumphal entry, seemingly they're going to miss the second one. It's coming. If you and I are not careful, we... If we do not study scripture and understand it and understand the times, you and I can miss things that God wants and has for us. So we need to be alert and aware. We have an awesome God who can fulfill his own prophecy in great detail. And that awesome God will never disappoint us in fulfilling his future prophecy either. He deserves our worship. Now, we celebrate today the few people who, who did welcome Jesus Christ into Jerusalem and did sing Hosanna and realized that he was their Messiah. May we today worship him as King of kings and Lord of lords, for today he is not in that same frail body that he uh, came um, on that donkey with. Today, our picture of him is Revelation 1. He is glorified, he is exalted, he has a brand new glorified body, and uh, that description is uh, telling what he's like in heaven today, waiting to come back the second time, and you and I worship a King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's why we sing on a day like today about crowning him and hailing him and ma his majesty and so on. We have seen this morning that God's Messiah presented himself right on time according to God's prophetic timetable. God promised the Messiah's coming throughout all the Old Testament history. And then specifically to Daniel gave us exactly when he was coming. Jesus Christ formally presented himself as the Jewish king as he rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey. But it was the day of their visitation. And unfortunately, they missed it. God has, of course, not given us that same time expectation. He tells us to be ready at any moment's notice for the rapture, for when he's coming to take us, his bride, to be with him forever. And so we need to be living ready all the time. What a great expectation we have. We need to be ready to meet him. And he also wants to know what he's going to do with the nation of Israel. He's not finished with the nation of Israel. Again, unfortunately, uh, there are many segments of the church that believe God is done with Israel because they've rejected him as their Messiah. No, his promises still stand. The Davidic covenant is still unconditional. Uh, someone from the line of David, which Jesus Christ is, is going to sit on the throne forever and ever for eternity. And yes, there's going to be a, a millennium, a thousand year reign. Jesus Christ is going to come back and rule and reign and all those prophecies are going to be fulfilled in detail because that's the way God fulfills his word. And so he deserves our praise. Father, thank you for this day of celebration of your triumphal entry of your son, the Messiah, as he came into Jerusalem and presented himself formally as the king of kings and um, uh, the Jewish king. And yet they did not study Daniel's prophecy. They did not understand this was the day of their visitation. May we learn from this that we need to understand and comprehend all that you give us in your word and that you are all powerful and sovereign to fulfill your own word and your prophecy to the very detail. And I thank you for that. I thank you that we have that prophecy. I thank you we have that track record of your awesome faithfulness. 
Father, may we worship you for the God that you are. And may we worship Jesus Christ for the King that he is. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.